In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Humanity has been awed and fascinated by the physical universe throughout history. It was once viewed as majestic testimony of God's creative power. But as scientists unravel many of the mysteries of the cosmos, they are changing the way we look at the universe and our world. Within the Earth's crust, they have discovered a fascinating and complex history of life. These discoveries raise challenging new questions for those who believe in God. Can the Bible's account of creation be reconciled with scientific fact? That's the question we'll examine in this episode of Science and Religion, Bridging the Gap, as we explore the topic, creation or evolution? I'm a teacher, a minister, and a journalist. As a teacher, I believe I have a responsibility to prepare young people for their future. As a minister, I want to help them develop a faith in God, a trust in the Bible, and a commitment to Jesus Christ. And as a journalist, I must keep aware of the latest trends and developments in this ever-changing modern world. And there are times when these three roles seem to conflict, and never so much as when we're discussing the subject of the origins and the development of life. You see, science has one explanation. The Bible seems to have another. What's a young person to think? The Bible's explanation of the origin of life is found in the book of Genesis. The commonly accepted scientific explanation, based on the theory of evolution, suggests that life emerged initially and developed gradually through natural processes. It's an explanation that seems to do away with the need for God's involvement. So, how should we regard the biblical account in the face of scientific evidence that seems to contradict it. That's what we're going to look at today. The theory of evolution is taught as fact in schools and colleges. It has become, in effect, the only scientifically acceptable explanation, and it seems to strike at the heart of the Bible's teaching on creation, that it was God who created the heavens and the earth and all that is in them. Can we have faith in the biblical account of creation in the face of what seems like overwhelming scientific evidence that it isn't true. And if you can't trust its very opening statements, why should you believe the rest of the Bible? Why should it be a reliable guide to ethics and morals, a way of life, or even to be trusted, as the Apostle Paul wrote, to make us wise unto salvation? People should not grow up thinking that they have to choose between their God and their rational capacities. Because after all, when God created us, he made us different from the animals, and we presume that he uh, had some special reason for that. And so the intelligence that allows us to appreciate both the nature of God, but also the nature of the universe that God created, I'm sure that's very much a part of God's plan. I think that's part of what uh, Genesis means when it talks about us being created in the image of God. That is, we have the mental capacities to image the world and to image God. And so it would be a shame to think that we had to choose between God and intelligence. These are important questions, perhaps more so today than ever before because scientists are increasing our knowledge of the nature of our physical universe. Some exciting things are happening on the frontiers of knowledge. That understanding is causing thoughtful people to look again at those opening words of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Many people don't see a contradiction between science and religion. Or if they do, they're not worried about it. They accept the creation as the creative power of an almighty God. They may not exactly understand how he created the universe, the earth and life, but they accept it on faith, as it says in the epistle to the Hebrews. It is by faith we understand that the universe was formed by God's command, so that what is seen was not made by what was visible. But for others, it's not so simple. The accomplishments of science and technology are so persuasive. We don't always recognize how technological advances change, not only how we live, but how we think, what we accept as possible and impossible. Most of the things we take for granted, air travel, automobile, telephones, television, 
have actually only been invented or at least become practical realities within the lifetime of many people living today. Today it's so easy to just get in a car or a train or a plane and in a matter of hours you're anywhere on earth. 200 years ago there were still vast parts of the world yet unmapped. A galloping horse or a fast sailing ship was still the fastest way for people or news to travel. Most people never did go anywhere and knew very little of the world beyond their immediate neighborhood. In most ways, people living two centuries ago had more in common with the people living in Bible times than with us today. So it should not surprise us that even the most brilliant and inquiring minds had little reason not to take the Bible at face value. And so they could accept its teachings on creation as scientifically valid. Science and faith were not in conflict. In fact, the scientist was thought of as a rather obscure figure on the fringes of society, spending his time trying to turn lead into gold or looking for the elixir of life. Copernicus and Galileo did challenge the church's official understanding that the universe revolved around the earth, an idea that actually came from Greek philosophy but was accepted as truth. Copernicus and Galileo were regarded as heretics, but eventually the weight of scientific evidence overcame the superstition. But even after this better understanding of our place in the cosmos, there was still no reason to doubt that, in the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth and all that in them is. Even the great Isaac Newton, who laid the foundations for our technological age, was a deeply religious man. He believed that God had written two books. There was a book of nature and the book of scripture, the Bible. One was the book of God's works, the other, the book of God's words. One is the book about the creation, the other, the book about the creator. And so until about two centuries ago, most scientists saw no reason to choose between God and science. But then came the Industrial Revolution. It transformed not only our way of life, but also our understanding of the earth that lay beneath our feet. You see, an essential part of industrialization is mining, taking coal and oil and mineral ore from the earth. And as the need for fuel and raw materials became greater, mining engineers needed to know what to look for and where to look for it. So as they sank their shafts deeper and deeper, scientists began to gain a much better understanding of the layer of rocks called strata that make up the earth's surface. It was the beginning of the science of geology. In 1830, Charles Lyell published his three-volume Principles of Geology. In it, he suggested that what were known as geological events, the folds and faults of the strata, could be explained by natural causes. If this was true, then the Earth was shaped not by the hand of God in a creation week, but by slow changes brought about by natural processes. It also showed that these rocks were a lot older than a few thousand years, and this was significant, because if the rocks were old, so must be the fossilized remains of the plants and creatures found in them. So fossils began to pose a challenge to what Genesis seemed to be saying. Of course, these scientists weren't the first people ever to find fossils. They're quite common on exposed cliffs and riverbeds. But they had assumed that these creatures still lived somewhere on Earth. Remember, large parts of the world were still unknown. So perhaps somewhere in the high mountains or the Amazon rainforest or deep in the oceans, monsters still existed. Explorers had traveled to nearly every corner of the earth. They brought back many exotic, strange creatures, but no dinosaurs, no sea monsters. But as the knowledge of geology was increasing, so was our knowledge of geography. Geologists began to classify the rocks into what is known as the geological column. You'll find it in any geology textbook. The oldest rocks at the bottom, newest on top. And of course, this implied that any fossils embedded in the rock were also old, the remains of long gone creations. It was a dilemma. 
the record of the fossils suggested that creatures could change. It looked as if old forms of life flourished and then died, and new forms took their place. But the Bible had said nothing about this. What happens in the modern period is that just as the theologians get it all worked out so that they can harmonize their Christian faith with the worldview of that era, new scientific discoveries come along, ruin the old medieval worldview, and then Christians are having to scramble to catch up again. Some scientists of the early 19th century interpreted the fossil evidence of the disappearance of earlier species and the appearance of new, more advanced species as positive proof of God's creative hand at work. They assumed that God had periodically created new life forms and allowed previously created species to die out. But others saw a major problem. Scientists were saying that these creatures were living millions of years ago. But the Bible seemed to indicate that the Earth was created only a few thousand years ago. Who was right? What happens to our faith in the Bible when scientists tell us that the fossils are remains of creatures that walked the Earth millions, not just thousands of years ago, as the Bible seems to indicate? I mean, what are we to make of this? I think we're going to do this somewhere just a little less dangerous. Scientists tell us that the first dinosaurs appeared about 210 million years ago. They ruled the Earth for nearly 150 million years during what's called the Mesozoic era of prehistory, becoming extinct about 65 million years ago. Well, maybe not quite extinct. With the marvels of robotics, artists and engineers have been able to recreate dinosaurs like baby Apatosaurus here. He so really almost seems alive. Come on. Come on. There you go. Yeah, it's good, isn't it, eh? <laughs> good. Uh-oh, here's Mama Apatosaurus. Oh, what's up? Didn't you like me feeding your baby? Oh, not between meals. Okay, okay. How could these creatures have lived millions of years ago when the Bible seems to indicate that the Earth was created just a few thousand years ago? Obviously, it poses some serious problems if you insist that the Earth is a relatively recent creation. But some do. They insist that everything, the universe, the Earth, all animal species that have ever lived, including our friendly monster here, came into existence just 6,000, or at most, 8 to 10,000 years ago. They explain the fossil evidence by saying that all fossils were formed just a few thousands of years ago. Now, this explanation demands that the entirety of the geologic column, those pancake layers of rocks and fossils we discussed a moment ago, were deposited in one fell swoop, like the flood of Noah's day. They believe, in other words, that there is no geological or stratigraphic sequence representing the passage of time. And of course, if there's no geological sequence, then the whole theory of evolution crumbles. In some ways, this is an attractive theory, but is it right? Will it stand up to systematic investigation by the scientific method? What do we mean by that? Well, there's nothing really mysterious about the scientific method. It's just a way of investigating an idea or a problem or examining something in a disciplined, logical, and systematic way. And there's a lot more to a museum than glass cases and old artifacts. Ah, here's a good example of the scientific method in action. You see how the fossil is being carefully removed from the surrounding soil. She's not just hacking away, she's moving carefully and systematically, trying not to disturb or break anything. 
It's not just a question of getting the fossil out. These people want to learn as much as they can about it. So they proceed carefully without making guesses or assumptions so that the evidence can be analyzed and interpreted accurately. It's the same in any branch of science. Knowledge is built systematically according to accepted rules and measurements. Other scientists can then evaluate the results and compare them. In this way, the theory or hypothesis can be examined and confirmed, or perhaps found to be false. The scientific method is not perfect because it's hard for any of us to be completely objective, but it has produced some spectacular results over the last 300 years as we've systematically added to our store of knowledge. But the point is, the investigation must be objective. It is important not only to have evidence that confirms what you believe, it's also important to evaluate evidence that indicates that your theory or idea is not right. And if necessary, adapt it, adjust it, or even reject it if and when the evidence shows that it's incorrect. So remember when we were discussing how some people believe the Earth is only a few thousand years old? They base it on what they think the Bible tells us. So we need to ask, is this true? If it is, there should be scientific evidence to confirm it. But what if the scientific evidence points in another direction? We need to test this idea carefully. Let's go and meet someone who can help us do just that. A good place to test this theory is up here, where you can see some of the Earth's interior has been exposed. A good person to explain it to us would be a geologist, like my good friend Dick Berkey here. Oh, hey, John. How are you? Good to see you made it up. Huh. Quite a place, isn't it, John? Quite a view. Dick, what about this idea that the Earth is just a few thousand years old? Well, this is why I wanted to bring you up here, John. If you'll notice, the strata that we see here in front of us extend on down. They actually go beyond that lake down there. And then if we look up the other direction, these strata lying one on top of the other extend clear up to beyond yeah, that I see lake it. up there. Yeah. There is literally over eight miles of sequential strata that have been deposited one on top of the other in this area. And you'll notice, of course, it's tilted up. Yeah. It's not lying flat. It was deposited flat. The strata is always deposited in water flat. Yeah. Okay, later on, Earth movements have moved this strata up on its side. And then once it's done that, you can see a lot of strata are missing. There's a tremendous amount of erosion has occurred since that time and taken that material out. So it's eight miles that way, but what we're really looking at is eight miles this way that's been tilted on its side. Okay. Took a long time to deposit it, then a long time to erode it once it was tilted up. How long would it have taken? Give me an estimate. This took about six million years to deposit, extending from about 10 million years ago to about three or four million years ago. Now, John, there are other places in the southwestern United States that show us much more extensive passage of time. The Grand Canyon in Arizona is an excellent example showing geologic time. As determined by our best radiometric dating methods, the strata of the canyon were deposited between 1.7 billion and 250 million years ago. Most don't realize that even the youngest rock of the Grand Canyon, those that are actually deposited on the rim, were deposited before the dinosaurs were even in existence. The canyon strata contains many fossils, like trilobites, ancient fish, and plants that are known to predate the dinosaurs. But how rapidly are strata deposited? Some people may look at an outcrop of strata and immediately conclude that it must have been deposited rapidly. But as we will see by looking more closely at depositional features, such conclusions are often completely wrong. Okay, let's go look at them. What I'm seeing, Dick, here is a pretty impressive cliff face, but as a geologist, 
You're, you're reading a whole lot more into it, aren't you? Well, what I see it, John, is a several hundred foot section of an eight mile thick uh, sequence of strata that has been deposited. How do we know that this was deposited over a period of time and not all at once, as some people would have us believe? Well, on just an overview, you might think that it was all put down in one very rapid succession, but take a look over here. Here are two layers of ripple marks. Now, those are a specific yeah. kind of ripple mark that are made in standing water. So that this wasn't done by rapidly flowing water, but there was two periods of time where there was standing water standing there. But I have better things to show you down here that will prove it even more. So look at it. You remember how it rained about a week ago? Yeah. Uh, this was completely wet and the clay had soaked up and become saturated with water. Well, now it has dried out and as it dried out, the clay shrunk and formed these very characteristic cracks. Now, if while those were dry, we had wind or another layer of water came over before they were able to absorb the water and filled with a different type of material like this sand. Right. And then this was overlaid by another layer. We would have a fossil mud crack. Okay. I want to show you something up here in the hill now. See done here this sand represents the same thing as we were putting in the cracks mm -hmm. down there on those mud cracks. Only now it's sandstone. Only now it is solidified into sandstone. And the clay that was in here, some of it is eroded off, some is still there. But the, the sandstone hardened, and so it is the most preserved. Okay. And this layer extends back up here. You can see it. You can see it up here. And then if you look over here, now it's not as noticeable because a lot of this has worn off. But on this surface, we can also find the similar patterns. And if we go into this clay layer up here, we find also layers of mud cracks. Here's an example. You see the same thing, mm -hmm. our sand in the pattern that filled in the clay, the cracks in the clay, yeah. and then another layer was down on top. So we have layer after layer after layer of mud cracks, meaning that this was exposed to drying, then a wet period, then drying, then a wet period. And we're talking about just a small section of eight miles of strata. It always surprises me how a geologist can make what, to most of us, just looks like an ordinary looking cliff face really come to life. Remember is that as we're walking along, in a sense, we're going deeper and older. Into older but strata. This, these yes. rocks have been turned on this side, this yeah, whole they're, hole. They've been turned up this way, yeah. and we're walking down into So we're, in a sense, going deeper. Back in time as we walk. Here's an outcropping where if you just looked at it, you might think that it was all deposited very suddenly. Obviously, it's deposited by water, but how fast was it done? Let me show you something to see if we can figure that out. See, here we are, John, at the top of that sandstone layer that we saw going across the strata. And you might think that, well, this was deposited rapidly, but look at this head right here. This is what you call a stromatolite. Now, what a stromatolite is, is a layer by layer buildup of algae that was actually living over the surface. And it was building, it has a very characteristic structure that it, that it creates. It was putting down lime, which is calcium carbonate, which is, was extracting from the water, just like a limestone. To prove that, we have a little hydrochloric acid here. We'll oh, yeah. see how it fizzes? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. This whole thing has yeah. just been built up by carbonate, by mm -hmm. algae. Mm -hmm. And not only does it occur here in this spot, but you see on top of the 
the strata, it occurs all the way up through there. Well, that wasn't done overnight. That took probably at least several years to do that and maybe more. So we know that from the time this was deposited till the time this was deposited, we have probably at least several years interval. Uh, so that's one thing you might not notice as you're just walking by, but when you look closely, you see there's more time in the record than what you might think. Now, it not only occurs here, but you can follow up through this outcropping, and you can see these heads formed all the way along up there. Well, we've only, if you'll pardon the pun, scratched the surface of what these rocks can tell us. But I think we've seen enough to understand that the Earth strata were not all deposited rapidly. It happened over extended periods of time. So the view that the fossil record is only a few thousands of years old must be rejected. The evidence shows that the Earth is not a relatively recent creation. Dinosaur fossils are tens of millions of years old. And to believe otherwise is to improperly understand the physical evidence. So is there a way to reconcile science and the Bible concerning the age of the Earth? Yes, there is. You see, there's really no definitive statement anywhere in the Bible that denies the immense antiquity of the Earth. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 simply states, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the Earth. No time frame is assigned to that event. We shouldn't confuse the beginnings of human civilization, as described in the early chapters of Genesis, with the creation of the Earth billions of years earlier. Then there's no longer any basis for conflict. The Bible doesn't contradict scientific truth. I think there's something wrong if there is a contest there. I mean, I believe that God made the world. Um, I believe that it is possible to find out something about how the world works, because we're living in the world. Now, if there's some conflict there, there's something wrong in our understanding. When properly understood, science and the Bible needn't be in conflict. It takes both to give a complete picture. You see, it's possible to explain something in two entirely different ways, and yet both would be right. For example, what are you looking at? Me, right? wandering around in the mountains talking about fossils. But in actual fact, that's not what you're looking at. Move in close. No, no, real close, real, real close, close as you can get. Now what are you looking at? Your TV screen is made up of millions of dots of phosphorescent material, red, green, and blue. When these dots are excited by an electron beam from the cathode ray gun in the TV tube, they glow. It is this that gives the optical illusion of a picture of me. What you're really seeing are those millions of glowing red, green, and blue dots. So, which is right? They both are. Which is a better explanation? Well, that depends who you're explaining it to. A TV engineer is concerned with the technical explanation. But if your friend asks you what's on TV tonight, it isn't very helpful to say, oh, red, blue, and green dots. We need to understand that the Bible was not designed to be a science textbook. The book of Genesis was written to teach the central truth that God alone is the creator. The age of the earth was not an issue. God has left us to study the details of the creative process for ourselves. As a scientist, I think one of the big problems is when we start leaving major factors out of our understanding. And if this is really God's world, if he really created it, if we are really uh, his people, to leave out um, a major input of what he tells us about it is going to distort the whole thing. So no, it's going to make it much, much worse if we leave out Genesis. And I put Genesis in with Deuteronomy, Jeremiah, Job, the Gospels, the Epistles and the lot. It's all part of God's message to us. In other words, the Bible tells us who did the creating and why. And science can help us understand when and how it was done. They complement each other. Science is looking at one kind of experience, looking at how things happen, and religion is asking a different sort of questions, why things happen. And if I want to understand this one world in which I live, I need both those in science. Now, when I read the Bible, I have to ask myself, what am I reading? And I, when I read Genesis 1 and 2, which are very powerful parts of Scripture, actually, I don't think I'm reading a divinely endorsed and guaranteed textbook of science. God has not caused those Scriptures to be written to save us the trouble of finding out how the world is. 
He's caused those scriptures to be written to tell us why the world is. And the message of Genesis 1 and 2 is that everything exists because of the will of God. That's a theological statement, and it's a very important and uh, fundamental theological statement. And I don't think in any sense it contradicts what I know scientifically, for reading the book of nature, as people used to say, um, about the how of the universe and how that uni universe has in fact developed its, its fruitful history. To believe in the Bible doesn't mean you have to disregard the findings of science. Neither need a scientist ignore the revelations of scripture. It takes both science and the Bible to achieve a complete picture. So dinosaurs and other prehistoric species can then be seen for what they are, a marvelous testimony of God's creative work that began on Earth millions, billions of years ago. And you can reconcile when these creatures lived with the Bible. But what about the question of how they came to be? Could they have just evolved by natural processes? That's the next question we need to explore. You're a beautiful lizard. You know that? This is Maya. Isn't she beautiful? You're beautiful. She's an iguana. And the Bible says God created her. The commonly accepted scientific explanation would be that she developed gradually over millions of years from a chance combination at the edge of a primeval ocean. And from this first spark of life involved all the birds, animals, trees, cacti, and all the millions of life forms on Earth today. Which is right. Let's take a closer look at Darwin's theory of evolution. Do that, shall we? Darwin was the son of a doctor. While studying theology, he discovered his real interest was botany. So instead of becoming a theologian, Darwin became a naturalist. A year after Lyell published his Principles of Geology, Charles Darwin set sail on the HMS Beagle on a five-year, round-the-world voyage of discovery. Charles Darwin has gotten the reputation for being the evil genius behind the theory of evolution, but that's not really fair. He was a brilliant and careful scientist with an inquiring mind. And when the Beagle visited the remote Galapagos Islands off the coast of South America, Darwin noticed there were several kinds of finches on the islands. Each was slightly different to the other, and they all differed from the finches found on the mainland. Each of the Galapagos finches seemed to have become adapted to its particular environment, even though they presumably had a common ancestor. It was the finches and the other creatures that caused Darwin to cautiously recognize that he may have discovered the process by which species change. But he also recognized that this was a potential bombshell, and he hesitated to publicize his theories. So he sat in them for 20 years. But in 1859, he was persuaded by his scientific friends to publish this book, The Origin of Species. It was a book destined to change the way the world looked at the origin and development of life. Darwin was not the first to suggest that life evolved. Some of the ancient Greek philosophers thought that. But he was the first to suggest a scientifically plausible explanation of how creatures evolved. In essence, evolution is based on two premises. The first is that living organisms are subject to random variation through mutation. And secondly, some mutations, see his beautiful coloring here, give their recipients a natural advantage, so that through natural selection, or what came to be known as survival of the fittest, new species can develop. Evolution caught on and gained a wide public acceptance, and it was considered a challenge, indeed a threat, to the biblical explanation. The theory as proposed by Darwin, and then developed and refined by his disciples, has become the only acceptable scientific explanation for the origin and development of life. And although evolutionists admit that they don't adequately understand how evolution happens, that it happened is non-negotiable. And today, evolution is the only explanation of the origin and development of life taught in many schools. But should it be? 
The origin and development of life through evolution is a theory we need to examine very carefully. This potential for variation in animals and plants is sometimes described as microevolution, and it explains why we have such a variety of life on Earth. Not just generic dogs, cats and horses, birds and fish, but hundreds of different breeds. The key question is, how much can species change? Since normally parents produce offspring that are the exact replicas of themselves. We've unraveled much of the mysteries of genetics and heredity. By carefully selecting the stock, breeders have long known that certain characteristics of living plants and animals can be enhanced or eliminated. By carefully selecting the stock, make Shelby here a valuable thoroughbred while, while Jessa's well, of less specific ancestry. They're both dogs, but this one's a product of carefully selected breeding. No Jessa here just happened. There's no question that any species can change, but can it change into an entirely different species, something which is so radically different, we know that we are really dealing with an evolutionary event. That's the question. The theory of evolution suggests that this potential for variation within species eventually allows one life form to gradually evolve into another entirely different species, a process sometimes known as macro or big evolution. Now Darwin recognized that for evolution to happen, this macro evolution would have to occur. He didn't fully understand how it could happen. Nature is very limited in, in what it can do. And also, the genetic variation that is there is itself also very limited. What we know from selective breeding, and in fact, this gives part of the answer, a selective breeder, say, of, of racehorses or of roses, will know that you cannot necessarily have um, every combination of desired characteristic that you want. For example, you might take from one variety of rose the particular the particular color that you want, and you'll ha have that as one of your parents. You might take from another variety of rose the scent that you want. So you might think that by matching this color with that scent, I'll produce the perfect colored scented rose. It doesn't necessarily work that way. It doesn't work that way with selective breeding for, for us any more than it works in nature. So it's not so easy to create a new species by tinkering about with what they already have. You, you simply can't take the characters as isolated bits and then rearrange them and come up with something new. There are genetic constraints which prevent that. Think of this built-in potential for variation within the species as a pack of cards. You can shuffle them and get many variations. And these cards represent the chromosomes and the genes they carry. And they decide the characteristics. Shelby's hair color, Jess's big feet, even what the children look like. But no amount of shuffling is going to get you new cards. The shuffling of a deck of cards is a very good analogy, actually. The, the cards in this particular analogy are the chromosomes and the genes that the chromosomes carry. For example, in, in human beings, you know, we have certain, well, there's a range of characteristics among human beings. We have different colored skin, different colored eyes or hair, uh, different types of stature. Those are, that's the deck of cards we have to deal with. So let's recap. We know that change, microevolution, can occur within a species. And that's why we can have many breeds of dogs and cats and fish and horses. And it's tempting then to develop this further and suggest that one species can slowly develop into another. You've probably seen charts in museums or books tracing the evolution of the horse from a rabbit-sized creature that lived millions of years ago through various stages until we see the modern horse. But charts like this rarely focus on the frailty of the underlying theory. 
We still can't prove that changes this big happen naturally. Just the progression doesn't prove evolution. Let's look at the same kind of argument, only with another kind of horsepower. Here is the latest production model Ford. And here's the first production model. Between them is a whole family of automobiles that do indeed show changes and development. But do we think that this development just happened? Of course not. The changes are the product of intelligence and design. Some changes in auto lines may be gradual, but most are abrupt. Dramatic changes are made as new models appear. How does this compare with what we find in the fossil record? When you look at the fossil record, there certainly seems to be evidence of continual change. I mean, after all, um, in the earlier Paleozoic, uh, some hundreds of millions of years ago, you have sea creatures uh, which lived then, insects which lived then, which are no longer alive today. Something else replaced them. And in many cases, that's exactly what it was. It wasn't necessarily a, a, a change in the species. It was perhaps more of a replacement or a change in the, in the ecosystem. But we're not necessarily saying that one changed into another. What we see is a replacement. The fact that the evidence seems to point to the replacement of species and not gradual change explains why some scientists see a problem with the theory of evolution. Even Charles Darwin recognized there was a potential flaw in his theory. He knew that if evolution progressed slowly across the ages as he had suggested, we should expect to find evidence of many transitional forms, the famous missing links in the fossil record. The fact that no such fossils had been found was, Darwin said, the greatest objection which can be urged against my theory. Darwin wrote this in the early days of paleontology, when only a few fossils had been found and classified. But he was sure that further discoveries would validate his ideas. But they've not. Today, maybe 200 million fossils have been found and classified into perhaps 250,000 species. Now, some of these fossils appear to be transitional in design. But if what Darwin said were true, there should be tens of millions of transitional fossils found. I mean, let's face it. Evolutionists are basically saying that all the life that we see today and see in the fossil record has all come from bacterial types of, uh, of microbial life, from bacteria or blue-green algae. That somehow, over the course of millions of years, they have evolved into oak trees and magnolias, polar bears and ourselves. Now, really, is that possible? To take a simpler case, to answer, try and answer your question, how would you turn a carnivore into a herbivore? Well, what would be required? For a start, you'd have to alter the whole behavior of a carnivore from hunting its prey, for which it needs good sight or good smell or something, to now eat leaves or grass. You'd have to change its dentition, its teeth, for no longer tearing, but to chew and grind. You'd have to alter its whole digestive system and its enzymes. It would require such a whole suite of genetic changes it would be like converting a propeller-driven aircraft into a jet plane. But the evidence so far is that such major complex genetic changes just don't happen naturally. There does seem to be a limit to the change any organism can make, whether through natural processes or even through selective breeding. Scientists have confirmed this fact in ways that Darwin could never have imagined. Since Darwin's day, the knowledge of genetics has greatly increased. Do you see then why the theory of evolution is being challenged? Not just by creationists, but by scientists from many branches of science, who have a commitment to scientific integrity. They believe that because this fundamental premise of evolution cannot be confirmed when examined by science's own rules, then the theory is still an inadequate explanation for the origin of new species. Because, as we've seen, a scientific theory must be based on an objective analysis of facts. 
And so far, there's not enough evidence to confirm that evolution is the process through which life is created and diversifies. And if it cannot be shown that macroevolution, the changing of one species into a completely different species, occurs, then a fundamental premise of evolution is on shaky scientific ground. And to accept this theory, one needs, let's call it what it is, faith. Some paleontologists or evolutionary biologists might not like that word because it has religious connotations. But look up faith in the dictionary. One definition is a firm belief in something for which there is no proof. So faith it is, and other views of the origin and development of life deserve to be heard. Is there another way of looking at the evidence? Well, some scientists have noticed that the fossil record actually seems to indicate that life forms appear abruptly, exist with only minor variation for several millions of years, and then abruptly become extinct. And this, as we'll see in a moment, suggests a completely different explanation than gradual evolution of life from the simple to the complex. Some scientists and theologians feel that the fossil record, instead of supporting evolution, actually demonstrate instead a process that might be called creative design. Creative design is an idea that acknowledges the age of the Earth and the fossil record, while accepting that this is a product not of blind chance, but intelligent design. It's an alternative to the theory of evolution, and many scientists believe it's a better one. It does seem to fit the facts better. And it certainly makes no less sense to believe in intelligent design than it does to believe in evolution. But if the universe, our planet, life, is a product of intelligent design, who or what did the designing? It's tempting to say, obviously, God. But a careful, fair-minded scientist would say, well, maybe. But that's not really a matter for science to decide. You see, even scientists who believe in God are quick to point out that their faith does not rest totally on scientific evidence, because matters of faith are beyond the scope of science. Science, by definition, is a study of natural processes, and that means you look at one event, and you look and see what happened just before that, and you see if you can find any regular connections between events of that kind and events of that kind. And so science, by definition, is going to be blind to God's action. That means that when the scientists claim that they've looked and they see that God is not acting there, they're going beyond the bounds of what science can legitimately say. The search for origins is there for an arena where science and religion should meet with mutual respect and tolerance, recognizing that each has some part of the story to tell. So, if while examining the questions of the origins and development of life, science finds it can't adequately explain the subject, it cannot claim a scientific explanation as being the only valid one. On the other hand, if scientific research contradicts a carefully held belief, theologians should be willing to re-examine it, and if necessary, reconsider. Otherwise, aren't we in the same mindset as those churchmen back in the Middle Ages who refused to believe that the Earth revolved around the Sun, in spite of overwhelming evidence that it did. The point is, as Galileo said, truth cannot contradict truth. And if and when scientific evidence seems to contradict the Bible, either one or the other, or maybe both, have been misunderstood. And we live in an age of unprecedented discovery we are able to probe further and further into the very nature of matter itself. And we're discovering new inner universes where our instruments cannot go, 
where the tools are mathematics and imagination, where our minds can wander briefly but quickly get lost. The next 50 years may see great breakthroughs into the scientific understanding of the fundamental nature of matter itself, and this may have great philosophical and theological implications. But science can only take us so far. To that which can be investigated by our five senses and the tools we have developed to enhance them. And those same instruments indicate there may indeed be something beyond, a level of reality, of truth, that lies beyond our mere physical means of investigation. And to complete the investigation, we must be willing to go outside of science and take seriously the claim of Genesis that in the beginning it was God who created the heavens and the earth. And there are signs that science and religion are beginning to come together in a more concrete way. From both the science side and the, the Christian side, there has been a huge growth in interest in getting the two together. Um, on the science side, one of the things that's happening is that the scientists themselves are realizing that their scientific inquiries raise questions that science alone can't answer. For instance, when you're studying the history of the early universe, uh, it raises the question, how did it all get started in the first place? And that's a question that's beyond the limits of what science can handle. And so physicists especially and cosmologists realize that they're forced to raise religious questions. A strictly scientific explanation that leaves the possibility of a creator out of the picture also leaves out the possibility that that creator had a reason for his creation. But to know and understand that reason is a vital part of education. The Bible reveals what we cannot discover, or at least fully understand, with our physical senses. And one of the most important things it tells us is that man is not just a physical creature. The Bible tells us that we are made in the image of God, unlike anything else in creation. Even scientifically, we recognize that there's a difference between us and other creatures, a difference that cannot be explained just by the study of anatomy. And so, a naturalistic or atheistic explanation that man is just an animal leaves some very important questions unanswered. Well, here we are back in the classroom again. Perhaps not the most exciting place. But a classroom or lab can be exciting because it's here where you'll lay the foundation for the education that'll carry you through to the rest of your life. A good solid education is more important today than ever before because you do indeed live in the most exciting time of discovery ever with perhaps some of the most profound and important discoveries just ahead. In these learning years, while you're laying down the foundation for your education, you're being exposed to many ideas. You're forming what is known as your worldview. Your worldview will decide not just what you know, but how you understand what you know. It's a framework for your beliefs. So take care how you build that worldview. It's important to learn all you can about the world around you and about yourself. But remember, a purely materialistic view of the world is not enough. Knowing what is inside us, the internal organs, the skeleton here, still won't tell us all there is to know about what mankind is or what we are for. What is the purpose for life? Do we even have a purpose? You're never going to learn that just by what you'll observe scientifically. That's why God has given us this other book. It reveals spiritual knowledge, which can never be discerned just through our five natural senses. It tells us what we are, how we should live, and it shows us the way to eternal life. Eternal life, everlasting life, the quest of the old alchemists. It's a quest beyond science, but it is the legitimate quest of mankind. And when we understand that, God's other book, the natural world, the whole vast expanse of the universe, become even more wonderful because the physical creation can teach us something about God, his love of life and his love for us. The Psalms tell us that the heavens declare the glory of God. And in his epistle to the Romans, Paul reminds us that 
Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood by what has been made, so that men are without excuse. The life he has created can be found in the forests, the fields, the streams, the mountains. Even the deserts and the depths of the oceans are filled with living creatures. Sometimes that life is strong and powerful. Sometimes it is delicate and weak. Sometimes it's tiny or larger than life. Sometimes fierce, sometimes friendly, and often just cute. And like the old hymn says, the Lord God made them all. And the supreme example of his creation is us, male and female, made in God's image. The physical world is a fascinating place. Study it, enjoy it, make your mark in it, but never lose sight of the fact that there's another side, a side beyond the physical, just as real and even more important. You can learn about it in God's other book, the one that begins with the simple but vital statement that in the beginning it was God who created the heavens and the earth.